One of the instructions in breath meditation is to learn how to breathe in and out in a way that makes you sensitive to rapture, makes you sensitive to pleasure in the body. Now it takes a while to figure out how to do that. Part of it has to do with the way you breathe. Part of it has to do with how you focus your mind. But it's a skill you can figure out. Part of the problem, of course, is with that word rapture. It sounds like St. Teresa going into ecstasies. And sometimes there is a very strong sense of thrill that goes to the body. But what the Buddhists have you focus on more is a sense of refreshment. You breathe in a way that feels refreshing. It refreshes your torso, refreshes all the different parts of the body where you can feel the breathing process. And it starts out very gently. But if you give it some space, give it some time, it'll grow. Just a, a sense that things feel okay. Things feel like they've settled in where they belong. And you don't put any squeeze on them. You breathe in in a way that doesn't build up tension inside. And where you don't hold on to any tension when you breathe out. And just protect that area. Wherever you feel it, it things feel full and pleasant. And if you give them more time, that sense of feeling full will grow. The sense of pleasure will grow. And over time, you'll find that you can tap into this more and more regularly. It would be nice if we could say that things will just get better and better in every way and every day as you practice. But there are going to be ups and downs. You think that the mind would immediately want to incline to a state like this and do everything it could to protect it and maintain it. But the mind has lots of other agendas as well. So there are going to be times when things are pretty fallow. You sit down and meditate and the breath just doesn't seem to get comfortable, doesn't want to. Well, it's not the breath. The problem is with the mind those other agendas. And so you need something to pull you through when things get tough. This is where conviction comes in. There's a passage where the Buddha is discussing the causes that lead to suffering, and then beyond suffering is that the next step is conviction. Conviction that there's a way out. It doesn't end the suffering, but it actually puts a different cast on it. Because conviction itself has both a pleasant and an unpleasant side. The pleasant side, of course, is that it offers a way out, saying it's through your actions that you can make a difference in your life. The unpleasant side, the unpleasant side is that okay, your actions need to change. There's a part of the mind that doesn't want to change. And yet if it doesn't want to change, there's no change is going to happen. Solution doesn't come from outside. As the Buddha pointed out, one of our responses to pain, suffering, discontent, is bewilderment. And another one is the question, is there somebody who knows a way outside of this, or to escape from this pain? And the problem is that we tend to combine those two. There's bewilderment and there's a search for an escape, there's a search for help. And so our search for help gets bewildered, too. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha tried to give as much knowledge, insight into pain. So we realize where the true help lies. It lies inside. The help from outside is basically pointing out, this is what you need to do, so that you can end the bewilderment and then focus on what has to be done. And the path itself is going to involve some pain, because going against old habits is painful. And just simply realizing that there's, there's more work to be done, that's also kind of a painful thought. But it's pain with a purpose, a pain that takes you someplace beyond the pain. Because if you just believe, well, 
There's no escape from this. We just have to accept things the way they are. That closes off all the doors. The Buddha didn't teach that kind of acceptance. He taught that you should accept responsibility and then figure out what needs to be done. But the conviction that changing your actions, changing your thoughts, changing your words and deeds will make a difference. That's the fire that keeps you going. That's what keeps the door open. So we work on our conviction that the solution to the problem lies right here. And then from there we try to develop the qualities of the path, because they give more strength to the, our conviction. It's not a floating kind of conviction. It's something that's meant to be put into practice. As the Buddha said, one of the signs of conviction is that you actually practice. At the very least, you make sure that your actions aren't harming anyone, either in your words or your deeds. And then you go beyond that, try to develop the qualities of taking delight in developing skillful qualities and taking delight in, in abandoning unskillful ones. In other words, talk to yourself in a new way. Talk to yourself in a way that says, I want to see this go, this pain that I'm causing myself, these attitudes that I'm carrying around that are unskillful. And even if you can drop them for just a bit, learn to take some pleasure in that. Learn to take pleasure in the fact that you want to make a change. The Buddha says simply making the determination that you want to be skillful. Even before you act much on it, that is in it itself is a skillful thought, and you want to encourage that. And the best way to encourage that is follow through with it. As for the thoughts that tend to be self-destructive, you have to ask yourself why you like them. Well, part of them is laziness likes them, because th those are the thoughts that say, well, there's nothing much you can do, you're hopeless. That seems to somehow let you off the hook. Well, it lets you off the hook of some things, but you're still on the hook of suffering, and you're hooked really strongly. So even though the path does require some pain, there's pain in conviction, there's pain in following the path. There's an interesting passage where the Buddha talks about how once you get the mind into concentration, there are many different kinds of pains that don't exist there. One of them is the pain that comes from unskillful mental states. And then, interesting enough, he says that there's also, it's also an escape from the pain that comes from skillful mental states. That's an interesting idea, that some of the skillful states are going to be painful. Now, they're painful for a purpose. A skillful mental state that says, you know, I want to have more concentration, I want to get past this. That is a painful thought, but it's a good one. But as the mind settles down in concentration, you're going to have a sense of, okay, you feel okay right now. You're on the path. And there is a sense of well-being once you've learned how to focus properly, learned how to work with your breath properly. That takes the sting out of the fact that okay, there's still more work to be done. Because when you're in a state like this, you say, if there's more work to be done like this, this is good work. So when things are tough, look for what inside you is getting in the way, but also try to nurture the conviction that okay, you can get past it. You're capable of getting past it. And what efforts you make are not doomed. After all, as the Buddha said, if we couldn't develop more skillful habits, there would be no point in his teaching us. There'd be no point in our listening, there'd be no point in our meditating or anything. And if we were just automatons, if everything were determined over just material beings that have to feed our desires. Without any choice, okay, that would be that would be hopeless. But as the Buddha said, the whole point of the teaching is that it's we're not hopeless. We actually have good habits that we can develop, and we can make our choices. 
We don't have to follow our old ways. It is possible to turn a new leaf. And think of whatever pain you've got as your opening. We tend to be very tightly closed systems in the sense that when we've got a worldview, and as long as it serves our obvious interests, okay, we're happy with it and we don't want to have anything mess with it. And we're very resistant to change. And we can hear all kinds of Dharma. And if there's no sense that the state of becoming you're in, your sense of your world, who you are in your world, as long as there's no sense that there's anything wrong there, you're not going to hear the Dharma at all. Or what you hear is something else. I've had it happen again and again. People coming up and saying, what you said and this Dharma talk, or what you said that last year, whatever, just meant so much to me. And then they'll say what they heard me say, and I know I would never say anything like that. So it's obviously they were in some other world with some other issue. But it's when you got the pain. And you realize, okay, that the pain is coming from something you're doing. That's when you begin to open up. That's why there is that search. Maybe somebody out there knows something, some way to deal with this pain. That's the opening that lets the Dharma in, if you're willing to listen and take it to heart. And part of taking it to heart is developing that conviction, okay, this is a good path. It's the path that re makes you learn how to rely on yourself. And you've got the conviction that you do have the resources inside. Because what do you need to meditate? You need a mind that's aware, and you need a breath coming in and going out. Well, you've got those. And it's just a matter of learning how to be more and more observant. How do you focus on the body so you're not putting too much pressure on it without at the same time putting too little pressure? I mean, there's a certain amount of pressure that has to go with your focus. Otherwise, the mind just slips away. Too much pressure, of course, though, makes things uncomfortable in the body. Things start feeling clamped down on, and it gets unpleasant, and all you can think about is how much you want to get away. This is one of the reasons why once you find a spot in the body that's comfortable, you should immediately try to spread your awareness from that spot. Make that the center, and spread out from there. And the act of spreading relieves the pressure on that one spot. And then you work with the breath. And what way of working with the breath maintains that sense of ease? Sometimes you get a sense of ease and pleasure, but then you try to push it out. And of course, in the act of pushing it, you turn it into something that's unpleasant. These things can't be pushed. They have to be allowed to spread. You'll learn how to develop that touch. And you find that as you develop these skills, you're developing a lot of good qualities in the mind. And one of those is that you begin to see that your conviction was well placed, that you really can make a difference just in the way you breathe, sitting here focusing on your breath. That makes a difference in the sense of well-being in the mind. And it's always there. Sometimes you find yourself in a mood that takes a while to get back there, but it's there. And the more quickly you can tap into the sense of well-being, the easier it is to deal with unpleasant things coming up inside. You find that you can breathe right through them, and that helps to alleviate that pressure that you sometimes feel that you've just got to get it out of your system by saying something nasty to somebody else or saying something hurtful or whatever. The old attitude that as long as I'm suffering, I might as well make everybody else suffer. And you realize that that doesn't accomplish anything at all. It just makes things worse. So when the pressure builds up inside, you can say, okay, I can just breathe through it, allow it to dissipate. That gives you an immediate handle that this conviction is something you really can hold on to, and it really does make a difference. And you can train yourself to delight in abandoning the things that you used to hold on to. 
all the own unskillful habits, like little gremlins used to like. But they eat, they bite. You realize you don't have to keep feeding them anymore. You don't have to keep them as pets, just let them go. And it's this way that you this way that the pain of conviction actually turns into the pleasure of conviction confirmed. That this path does take you through difficult passages. And you can come out on the other side. <laughs>